racist individuals, racist institutions. And this is, of course, terrifically different from you know, a, a nation conceived in liberty, um, which is what we have been teaching up till now. Um, to discuss this, we are honored and delighted to have two uh, main speakers, moderated by yours truly. I'm David Randall, Director of Research, but the stars, Dr. Robert Woodson, founder and president of the Woodson Center, and Dr. Wilfred McClay, professor in GT and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma, and I will mention recently author of Land of Hope, a fine American history uh, textbook, you know, narrative of American history. Um, now, the way we're going to do it is like so. Um, first, Dr. McClay will speak uh, more on the historical aspects for about, say, 10 to 15 minutes. Then Dr. Woodson will speak perhaps more on the modern public policy aspects, uh, again, 10 to 15 minutes. These tend to overlap, obviously. We will then have 30 minutes or so of moderated discussion, where conceivably I will break early, depending, uh, because th th at the very least, the last half hour is going to be questions provided by everybody who's uh, listening in. And what you should do is go to the chat icon at the bottom of the Zoom panel, and that should be a, on my screen. It's to the right of participants and to the left of share screen. Um, when, or excuse me, not chat icon, I beg your pardon, question and answer. Sorry, chat, we'll also look at the chat, but question and answer is what you want right over all to the right. Put in your questions and the question and answer. I will then select from them uh, to you know, direct questions to Dr. Woodson and to Dr. McClay. And I should say um, there every chance that if you send in a you know, 100 questions, I won't be able to get all of them to Dr. Woodson and McClay, but if you send them to me afterwards to randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org, I will then forward your questions so that Dr. Woodson and Dr. McClay, can, uh, Bob and Bill, can have a chance to um, respond uh, privately. So don't worry if your question doesn't get answered. Uh, the other thing you should know is this is getting recorded it will show up on YouTube. Everybody who has been signed up ought to get a follow-up link uh, telling, uh, giving you, you know, uh, the website uh, where this will show up when we have it posted. And that's usually, I think, uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, I think that is every, oh, and uh, sorry, this is actually rather important. Uh, but this is not the only thing NAS is doing about uh, the 1619 project. We have, in point of fact, an online conference uh, next month, co-hosted um, by the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization and the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. So it's going to be online the week of September 14th to 18th. You know, it'll be well advertised by the NAS. You can see it as well. But in effect, we're going to have an entire conference and everybody around the nation will be able to see it. Uh, and um, it will have, you know, again, 15, 20 scholars and public intellectuals uh, all talking on this uh, very same subject. Um, anyway, uh, product placement. Um, I will now, I think, ask Dr. Wilfred McClay if you would be so kind as to speak for the next uh, 10, sure. 15 minutes. Sure. I don't know how much of this to do, but I think maybe we need to, uh, uh, re to, to, to rehearse some of what the, the project, the, the 1619 project, attempts to do. It really argues for a a uh, reframing of American history that, um, and it's not really clear exactly what's meant by that or by a um, interpretation of 1619 as the founding of a yet to be uh, for a century and a half um, United States of America. But, but at any rate, it's, it, is, uh, it is a kind of thought experiment in a way, but it's one that I think has uh, obviously longer range um, objectives, uh, which I think Bob Woodson will probably talk about much more effectively than I can. Um, 
So why why 1619? Well, 1619 is the date that we know uh, from uh, the testimony of John Rolfe that uh, 20 some uh, Africans were who, who were enslaved um, uh, uh, in, in aboard the ships uh, which um, uh, they they were uh, being carried. Uh, to the to the Western Hemisphere, were uh, were landed in Jamestown, um, uh, and therefore, it so the story goes, the the interpretation goes that um, this is the beginning of the sort of bacillus of slavery, of the taint of slavery being transmitted to British the British North American colonies and. There's a lot wrong with this um, factually, and and uh, some of it could be kind of tedious. So we don't know, for example, whether they were we whether they were slaves uh, after they they uh, landed, because there wasn't a provision for slavery in the English common law. Um, uh, the evidence points to them very likely having been indentured servants and. Uh, and uh, race-based slavery, the slave enslavement of Africans, doesn't become really established as a practice in Virginia for about another 50 years or so. So, um, but, you know, leave all that aside as a, a sort of journalistic hook, which I think is a good way to think about how this whole project was put together. It's journalistic and not historical. As a journalistic hook, 1619, uh, works um, works pretty well. Um, the question is: is it is it is it really does it provide a basis for rethinking the whole of American history? Um, and uh, why should we consider 1619 rather than 1776 as the founding? Uh, what what what? What's at stake in that? What uh, what insight is to be gained from that? Well, the the, the times uh, and it's and the, and the people who are putting putting the project together want to argue that in some ways slavery is an essential part of the makeup, of the, the DNA. Um, the, the Nicole, uh, uh, oh, I forget her name. The, the the woman who put this together uses this analogy of of DNA. Uh, 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 so it's sort of a permanent feature. Um, and this is all time for the, the 400th anniversary of 1619. And the, uh, the project came out in the fall of, uh, of last year. Um, I think it, it, just speaking partly as a historian and partly as a citizen, I think it was an enormous missed opportunity. I think there should have been a 1619 project I think it's actually quite a, a, a could be a really grand thing if it had been done properly, and um, and I it, what what do I mean when I say done properly? I I actually recur to um, some of you probably know W. E. B. Du Bois's uh, The Souls of Black Folk, and which among other things has a wonderful essay not to be missed about the uh, what we called spirituals, the sorrow songs uh, of African-American slaves. And, and he says this in uh, part of the commentary. He says, your country, how came it yours? Before the pilgrims landed, we were here. And I, and I think that's exactly what the date of 1619 can bring home is the history of African Americans, of Africans in, in this continent, Africans in America, and what would become the United States, is not just something that kind of floated in um, you know, somewhere along the way as a, a kind of um, um, add-on. Uh, it's essential. It's <laughs> Again, before the pilgrims landed, one year before the pilgrims landed, 1620, before the pilgrims landed, we were here. If the 1619 project had used this as its basis, it could have been a wonderful thing, something unifying, something that um, communicated um, 
to African Americans, this history is your history. It, you are a part of it. You are not cut off in perpetuity from the promise of American life. Um, but that wasn't the way that, uh, that the framers of this project chose to approach it. Um, I would just, I, I realize I'm already cutting <laughs> close to the time limit here, but I, I would no, just no, point please. to the 1619 versus 1776. The obvious point is that 1619 is describing a world in which the United States is <laughs> nothing that anybody could even possibly dream of, of an entity uh, comprised of, of, of united but autonomous or semi-autonomous, semi-sovereign states. Um, the, the, the political entity that the, the Declaration of Independence, which is you know, promulgated in 1776, said envisions. Um, it's a different world. It's slavery uh, is not being introduced into a virgin and pristine Western hemisphere in 1619. Slavery is already very old. Uh, actually, in the history of the world, slavery is very, very old, and, and uh, the enslavement of uh, people by other, of individuals by other individuals, uh, uh, has been more the norm uh, than the exception in human history, and certainly was in 1619. Um, the uh, in the Caribbean, <clears throat> in the, the areas of the of uh, the uh, much of the new world, as as the Europeans called it, uh, uh, that we're talking about, um, uh, vicious warfare, um, tribal rivalries, human sacrifice uh, were uh, quite normal, um, if hideous. Uh, the you know Cortez. Just to pick one example, Cortez uh, uh, was. Uh, um, probably uh, aided in, in, in uh, ways that were crucial by uh, opponents, uh, indigenous peoples who were opponents of the Aztecs who were uh, notorious for their practice of human sacrifice. Um, so I, 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 the, the idea that you get from reading Howard Zinn and writers like that, that uh, Columbus you know, intruded upon this pristine environment uh, like uh, uh, a nasty predator stumbling into a, a kindergarten or nursery school uh, with all the evils of the world. This is this is a very bad history, and uh, in fact, it, it it understates what happened in 1776. The significance of it that uh, the, the the notion of universal human rights, of universal human dignity, uh, uh, and, and that these rights in here in us because of our natures uh, as a gift, as an endowment from, from God. Um, this, this is a, a very, very, very rare um, um, idea uh, in, in the, uh, the, the early part of the 17th century. Uh, and, uh, and particularly in the Western hemisphere, which is, is less you know, it's more disorganized. There's more of an open competition among um, uh, the, the, uh, various various powers and entities. Um, it's it's not Europe, um, and uh, but but the practices that uh, Columbus and the Spaniards uh, took up were not alien to what was already going on in those those areas. So, so 1776 brings in. Uh, as a normative ideal, um, the, the ideas of self-rule, that uh, we are, uh, that, that, that governments are legitimate, even that whole idea of legitimacy of government, rather than just simply who, who's ruling. Legitimate government is based on our being self-ruling, that we are, have the consent of the governed. It's, is, uh, it's, it's a basis for that legitimacy and that um, governments that don't meet that standard, um, how we have the right uh, to change them. Uh, and we have those that right based on fundamental rights, 
stated by Jefferson uh, in the Declaration. Uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, uh, and uh, we've, we've expanded on that list somewhat. But, um, and uh, of course, when Lincoln comes around uh, um, and uh, is making the argument, making the arguments about eventually emancipation, um, he looks to the Declaration. Uh, he looks to the Declaration. He doesn't look to a longer history um, that that is, is indeed part of American history. And this is again, the part of what the 1619 Project could have done is you know, insist that we see slavery as part of American history, but as something, uh, an inheritance from an older world, an older moral, uh, moral universe that America represents at its best, the, the, the escape from uh, uh, that, that we bring into, into the picture, a whole new moral calculus. One of the things uh, that I talk about in my book, Land of Hope, is that, that there's, a, there's a moral revolution going on in the world. Um, and men like Jefferson are sort of like, <laughs> they're like surfers who are perched on a, on a, on a cresting wave that they, they look one way, they look another way. They're between these worlds, between this moral transformation that's going on. But I would finally mention that the anti-slavery movement um, is, a, is more a product of the American Revolution then, uh, you know, one of the grievous errors the 1619 Project makes is in claiming that the, one of the principal causes of the American Revolution was the right of, it was the desire of slaveholders to protect the institution of slavery. This is simply has no basis uh, in the view of uh, not just me, because I'm not a specialist in the period, but um, a whole slew of historians, Gordon Wood, probably the most single most eminent historian of the United States uh, now living, um, says he can't find any evidence in the documentary record for such a sentiment. I mean, it's very powerful, the objections to the project that have come from not just a few uh, random historians, but the very best. Gordon Wood, Sean Willens of, of uh, Princeton, James Oakes, um, uh, uh, Alan Gelzo, uh, really top-notch people. Uh, and the profession as a whole has been actually rather silent about it because I think there's a lot of sympathy for what are perceived to be the goals of the project, um, especially in the current environment but not a whole lot of uh, appetite for defending the, the actual historianship of, uh, of the, uh, um, Anna Nicole, uh, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, that's her name, uh, um, uh, and her, her um, collaborators uh, who are not, uh, some of them are, are distinguished scholars, but they're not people who are, who are specialists in the field. And, uh, I think it's been a great embarrassment for the New York Times to have come out and sided with a particular interpretation. And that's somewhat um, uh, out there um, interpretation and, and ideologically motivated interpretation of American history. And then found themselves really unable to defend it. Uh, Jake Silverstein of the New York Times, who was the executive editor or whatever, um, offered several um, I think very mealy mouthed and unpersuasive defenses that ended up eventuating in a kind of, well, uh, history is all interpretation, isn't it? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> those of us who spend time digging around the archives, trying to find the right documents and, and, uh, and the, the um, <clears throat> quantitative evidence for our assertions uh, don't quite see it that way. So uh, I think, and then, uh, um, Nicole Hannah Jones has more recently said, "Well, it's not really history after all. It's a, it's, it's narrative, um, uh, and uh, it's it's really an attempt of, at reframing, which is what they've said all along, at reframing the way the public remembers the past. It's about it's about the reframing of public memory." 
and this is why one one of the things I hope uh, Bob Woodson will talk about it. Certainly, we couldn't can the discussion is uh, this was not just something that was done as a journalistic project, and then uh, the thought was, hey, you know, this might have some potential for use in the schools. Let's why don't we look into that? No, this is this is a project that's been brewing for years. Uh, how many I don't know. It's certainly uh, at least. A couple of years. Yeah, well, and, and I mean consciously brewing. Uh, when uh, I, I uh, don't need to be snarky here, but when I, I know when, when David Brooks uh, wrote a column in favor of reparations, I thought to myself, something is cooking at the New York Times. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's some kind of policy that's come down from on high and, uh, and people are snapping too. Uh, and I was right. I was right. Uh, uh, Hannah Jones has said this a lot of this is directed towards trying to press the notion of reparations for slavery. So why don't I stop there um, and, uh, and and let my distinguished colleague, who I'm really honored to be sharing a Zoom screen with, uh, Bob Woodson, pick up. Well, thank you. And I think that's a good segue into my remarks, uh, I, uh, I reflect the uh, opinions and experience of a civil rights activist, community activist, looking back over that. But what you're saying about this is the continuation of a process that I think started 50 to 60 years ago with Cloward and Piven at Columbia University School of Social Work. She and her husband and others at the time, their goal was to promote socialism in the country. The only way to address poverty, they concluded, was if America would agree to redistribute, to redistribute income. And at the time of the Watch riots, they responded and said, here is an opportunity, and that's when the whole moral authority of the civil rights movement was hijacked mm. because they concluded that one of the ways that we can show the moral inconsistencies of capitalism is if we can create bankrupts in these cities. But in order to do that, they had to recruit blacks into the welfare system because accepting welfare in the black community prior to the war on poverty in 60 was a taboo. It was stigmatized. No one wanted to be on aid. <laughs> and so in order to remove that stigma, what they, they, they began to reinterpret uh, welfare as a social insurance and then reparations. And so their, their theory was if you can separate work from income, <laughs> it would make fathers redundant. And therefore, it would create school dropouts. There would be a disintegration of the nuclear family. And as a consequence, all of these pathologies would follow. But just having a social theory was insufficient to promote that kind of change. And that's when the war in poverty emerged. And the, and, and the federal government was, was persuaded to open uh, offices to recruit people into the welfare system by making it more generous than working. But they were also um, uh, joined in that movement by the black, black to Black Power movement at the time. They said that the, the uh, uh, two-parent households and nuclear family was Eurocentric and therefore racist. And so, and then the women's movement chimed in and said, uh, since they were anti-patriarchic uh, family, that they were joined. And so you had these powerful forces, the federal government now enticing people into the welfare system. You had the social moral revolution going on of the 60s, drop, uh, drop out, tune out, get high. So you had that uh, as a factor. And then you had the federal government welcoming people in. You had the Black Power Movement, the women's movement. Um, there was uh, all of the restrictions that were placed on welfare, such as uh, having to demonstrate paternity 
The ACLU uh, and, uh, began to file lawsuits and said it was a violation of the privacy provisions of a person. So therefore, having a baby out of wedlock was no longer looked upon as uh, a pathology and therefore requiring social services. The combination of these forces with the enticement of uh, uh, Fred Siegel um, wrote in his book, the, uh, 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 the future once happened here. He chronicles all this. And he says, as a consequence of these powerful forces, what Clown and Pittman predicted began to take place. You saw the disintegration of the family, school dropout rates began to fall. Over 3 million blacks flooded into the welfare system within a three year period in the 70s. And, and as a consequence, at a time when the unemployment rate for black men in New York was only 4%, and there was a labor shortage. And so as a consequence, um, prior to the 1960s, 85% of all black families had a man and a woman raising children. And of course, we know with Moynihan that began to dramatically decline to the point where today, 70% of all uh, of those uh, babies are born to single parent households. And we know about the crime, the drug addiction, the unemployment, uh, well, the 1776 people, they falsely attribute the problems facing black America today with the outer wedlock breaks the outer uh, uh, crime to the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. <laughs> and so uh, they have then hijacked that and say, well, the, and, and so they began to promote that as the cause of it slavery and Jim Crow. And, and so what we have done in, uh, at, the, at the Woodson Center is in not just in response, but we, we believe that the founding, that, that 1619, as you said, postures that because America was steeped in slavery, slavery is in its DNA, therefore the Declaration of Independence is, is a false document. And so all whites are then guilty uh, and villains uh, and in need uh, to be punished and all blacks are villains, victims in need of compensation. <laughs> and so, and, and so, so, the, so the message that they're sending that is very dangerous to low income black communities is that whatever problems that they are confronting, it is not their fault. That somehow until and then white people change it's impossible to expect black conditions. And that's a very dangerous uh, 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 phenomenon. So what we're doing is 1776, we have organized, uh, uh, since they are using race as the bludgeon to, to, uh, to destroy this country, we think the messengers have to be led by blacks as well. So therefore we have organized uh, uh, 25, scholars, but also activists around the country. Uh, and these are community activists whose lives uh, um, are the, uh, the living expression, they, their lives, their process of redemption and transformation of them personally and what they've done to revitalize urban communities. They are living by the principles that have been espoused by our founders. And so we have scholars writing about that. So, but our goal is not to offer a, an alternative debate. We wanted to offer an inspirational and an aspirational alternative narrative. So what we're doing is going back to, um, to challenge the notion that, that blacks were defined today by the legacy of slavery and discrimination. To refute that, we have essays that documents the fact that when whites were at their worst, blacks were at their best. In uh, 19, uh, one of our scholars talked about at the end of slavery, when they examined the records of six major plantations, they found that 75% of slave families had a man and a woman raising children. Well, those two parent households continue to exist for a century up until 19, uh, uh, 65, two-parent households. 
Uh, and so we offer this evidence that slavery and discrimination never truly defined the black condition. In 1920, the education gap between blacks in the South and whites was three years. Whites, it was eighth grade, blacks, it was fifth grade. Julius Rosenwald, the Jewish CEO of Sears, partnered with Booker T. Washington and they established 5,000 Rosenwald Booker T. schools. Rosenwald put up uh, $4 million, $8 million and the black community matched it. But because of these 5,000 Rosenwald schools over 20 years, the education gap in the South between 1920 and 1940 uh, was reduced within, within, within six months. Uh, between 1930 and 1940, at the time when racism was enshrined in law and the unemployment rate during the depression in black America was 40%, 25% for white America. Black America had the highest marriage rate, formation rate of any other group in society. Elderly people could walk safely in those communities without fear of being assaulted by their grandchildren. And so it was, so this is a direct refutation of the notion that slavery, the legacy of slavery, somehow prevented blacks from prospering. Economically, when we were denied access to hotels, we built our own. When we were denied medical schools, we built our own. Uh, another evidence, in 1929, in the Bronzeville section of Chicago, there were 731,000, I mean, 30, 731 Black-owned businesses. There was 100 million in real estate assets owned by Blacks in Chicago, with only, uh, and a 15, percent out of wedlock births. In 1929, we had our Black Wall Streets, Durham, North Carolina, uh, uh, Greenwood and Tulsa, Oklahoma, all over the country, uh, Blacks uh, uh, prospered in spite of discrimination. So what we're trying to, there were 15 or 20 Blacks who were born slaves who died millionaires. So part of our curriculum that we're developing will take some of this rich content and we are going to present it in curriculums, not just to black children, but to all of American children. So uh, 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 blacks can and should not be defined as uh, because of, of slavery discrimination. And so we really think that uh, tremendous harm is being done to this country by you, but the, uh, the extreme left are using race grievance as a bludgeon to discredit and destroy the civic institutions of this, of this country. The fact that Black Lives Matter uh, has announced its purpose is to promote social justice for Blacks, but they soon migrated from social justice for Blacks to denigrate the nuclear family, faith and community, the very instruments and values that Black America use to withstand the oppressive circumstances of slavery and fight against Jim Crow, those are now under attack by the very people who are supposed to be the champions of social justice for Blacks. Uh, and so I'll stop right there and uh, be glad to answer whatever questions you want. Well, there's also, I did, actually, the, the first thing is, do either of you have a, a question to direct to each other, you know, unprompted? No. Going once. Well, I, so actually, he, this is a sort of a question which I guess inspired by uh, the, the different um, focuses of the two of you. I, th this may be an either or question, which is silly, but What's more damaging in what the 1619 Project does, the way they undo the history up to 1865 or the way they undo the history after 1865? And, and, and I suppose an answer yeah. can be yes, but uh, <laughs> Bill, may I ask you I, first? Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm, that, that sort of um, gets at something I wanted to just comment on, not necessarily to question Bob about, but to uh, comment on it. So I think, the the uh, uh, the project 
really does. I, I think it, 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 you know, when I, let me put it this way, when I was in graduate school uh, too many years ago, um, but I happened to be in a department that had a lot of people working on slavery and a lot of interest in the subject, a lot of fr fresh scholarship. This was Johns Hopkins. And, uh, um, and one of the things that was very current and it really had been since the seventies, which is before I was in graduate school, uh, that this, that this legacy of slavery argument was, was, was too vague, too, uh, it didn't. It didn't really have a lot of explanatory power um, in terms of you know accounting for way the way things were now, um, and uh, and a lot more a shift towards Jim Crow. That that in fact, you know, if you a book like Herbert Gutman's book on the Black Family, which was a huge, hugely influential book at that time, um, uh, made made an argument. It went went through 1925 uh, from the 18th century through 1925. And, uh, but arguing that in fact, uh, the black family was much more intact than um, was, he was partly attacking Moynihan um, uh, and, 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 and uh, those who were in a contemporary setting, uh, arguing that the, the weakness of the black family was the source of all sorts of pathologies. And, uh, um, but, uh, but he makes a strong case for this, that the black family was strong and intact, uh, and there was a lot of resilience uh, through uh, the, all the tribulations of slavery and, uh, exactly. and, and the, the, the peonage of Jim Crow and, and the uh, legal uh, segregation and so on. Um, so I, I think there's, there's one of the things I really hate about the 1619 Project is it takes us back to this very simple-minded sort of notion about uh, the, this DNA being uh, planted, implanted or corrupted, or it's somehow or another it, at this moment in our history, and then all else flows from that. There's so many contingencies and, and complexities that that just completely ignores. And it, it gives people a, a kind of a malign foundational myth and that's what, in fact, I think the Times uh, did with this. Why they did it is something I can't completely fathom, what they uh, hope to accomplish with it. Um, but uh, maybe so, some of our auditors here will have ideas about that. Uh, well, I, I, I go further. I think that it's almost an expression of white supremacy. For, wow. them, for them to conclude that 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 one of, the, one of the promises of the civil rights movement that if blacks were elected to office and running these cities, that black America would be better off. Well, blacks have been running these cities for 50 years. And we've expended about $22 trillion on programs to aid the poor, where 70 cents of those dollars did not go to the poor. It went to those who served the poor. They asked which problems are fundable, not which ones are, are, are solvable. And so the question that the race issue begs to get answered is if race were the culprit, then why are blacks failing in institutions run by their own people? Now tell me how institutional racism causes thousands of black officials who have had the money and the power and the political muscle to direct the, those expenditures. How did white people manage to control and exercise uh, 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 white supremacy over those kind of relationships? How did they do that? A good question. <laughs> Uh, 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 Bill, do you want to answer that directly, or? Uh... Oh, uh, oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's it's. Uh, I think the culprit is liberalism and not race uh, issues right. of race. It's it, class. It, yeah. it, it has it has to do with um, uh, policies that have had that 
that in some cases have been extremely well intended. I, at least I would argue that, but um, uh, but it had adverse effects that uh, that are not irreversible. You know, I think we saw with welfare reform that uh, things started to improve um, uh, uh, dramatically. Um, uh, so the, the, we we need to um, think about the incentives and and, uh, and and various forms of behavioral influence that that our policy making has and and uh, uh, and uh, be, be much more uh, much more dis if I may use the word discriminating about the, those policies not to be uh, completely laissez-faire and, and not see the government as having any kind of role I think it does have a role the single, uh, biggest change, and and to me, one of the great civil rights issues is the uh, the way in which current institutions deprive not just African Americans but all sorts of people of of, of uh, more modest means uh, access to a decent education for their children. This is a just a crime, uh, and uh, it's there's one political entity. That at least when it comes to public schools, that it is in control, and we know what it is. It's the Democratic Party, uh, and the the organized <clears throat> forces of the, the uh, of uh, you know public education, teachers, lobbies, the NEA, and so on. Um, uh, they they in, exert an enormous amount of influence on the Democratic Party. I mean, these are the rank and file; these are the foot soldiers, and. So um, all these things are connected, and the fact that the 1619 project has already um, gotten educational materials that, again, are part of this several years long preparation, I think, of this thing. Um, they've already gotten those things out there and, and in the schools. All um, 50 states. Yeah, it's, it's – uh, and um, uh, this, as I say, this is not something that just sort of grew like Topsy because everybody loved it so much. It, this is a campaign uh, and it's a campaign being exercised by people who have the power to insert these materials in the schools um, without any kind of counter voice to them. Uh, and I think I it's- I want to follow uh, up on- Oh, you know, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I actually just wanted to make an unbelievably insertive segue. There's actually a question and question which speaks directly to this, and a lot of questions. What can we do? And I'll just select one of them. What is the most effective strategy for countering those school boards that are implementing the 1619 project in place of traditional American history? That's the point. Bob, do you want to start? Yeah, one of the things we're doing is we have about 2,500 low-income grassroots leaders in 39 states who are part of our network. They're Black, they're White, they're Native American, and they are the people that have the moral authority to speak for themselves and say that Black Lives Matter and these other anti-American forces do not speak for us. See, the moral authority of the left comes when they are the presumed uh, 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 representatives of the marginalized. Well, if the low-income people, uh, once they get this information and they become civic teachers of their own children and they understand how their children are being indoctrinated with this self-destructive message, we are arming them and they will go to the school boards and they will rebel and, and, and withdraw that moral authority from the left. So that's one of the strategies that we are, that's where we're producing uh, education content, but also we're, we are taking, making our grassroots leaders civic teachers because a lot of them have after school programs. Uh, and so we, we're, we have a multi-pronged approach, not just to the school boards, to teachers association, but also Make, building a groundswell from the people whose children are suffering as a consequence of this. Yeah, I, I, um, that's great. I can, I, I, I can add just a little bit to that. I, and I say this with real regret 
uh, and, and, and re sadness, remorse, all sorts of grievous emotions. But um, uh, I, I think that moving more and more in the direction of school choice and away from the sort of standardization of public education um, is, is one of the ways we can go. And we're going that way. We, we are going that way, we, we, even without it being a, um, quite as organized a movement as it could be. Um, I say this, I'm, I'm a product of public education. I had a wonderful experience going to public schools um, with my own kids. Um, we started out with them in public schools and then we put them in a, in a, in a church school and, and finally we ended up homeschooling them, and, which was a great experience. you know. My son's a professor of classics. I mean, he made <laughs> he made out. My daughter's a very fine uh, writer and editor. I mean, they made they made out all right. Uh, and uh, I think um, it's sad to me that something, you know, a little bit in me stirs when I hear articulate advocates for public education talk about how this is something that draws us together. And uh, I mean, there is an ideal there that is. It is beautiful. And that I think for the generations of Americans who were immigrants in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, for, for whom public education, you think of uh, you know, Jewish immigrants to New York. I mean, they're sometimes the most rhapsodic talking this way because for them, it was public education was a ladder of achievement. But public education had a curriculum. It made real demands. It, uh, you came out with a real education. Um, I've heard uh, people like Thomas Sowell and Colin Powell talk about, you know, the kind of education that they were able to get in the New York public schools. Uh, uh, unimaginable now. But uh, so I, there's a part of my heart that <laughs> is, is still touched by that vision. But I think we're so far from being able to get to it. I think that, uh, that um, it fragmenting what's what we have is a much better approach let 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 diversity reign institutional diversity institutional diversity different kinds of schools more and more charter schools more and more uh private schools of various kind including religious schools with uh, fewer constraints on the ways in which those religious school, schools can participate in forms of public support uh, that's that's what I see. I mean, I see that structural change is one that would have enormous impact, and would, and frankly, it would force the public schools to get on get on their game a little bit more. Um, I have a, I have a challenge to the group who are participating in this uh, in this forum and your association. That grassroots leaders who embody the principles of our founders, they really need allies. My, I have always said to conservative movement, what you're lacking is a ground strategy. I would like to see more of our scholars leave their classrooms and leave their hallowed halls and go into those communities and look for evidence of the principles and values that you write about. It would also help to validate uh, the people in those communities as having value. And I think it would deepen uh, your ability to communicate these ideas and principles to others. In the books that I have written, I make certain that I have interviews with people in there. James C. Scott in his book, Seeing Like a State, talks about there's meanest knowledge and epistemy knowledge. Uh, and in our market economy, we really embrace innovation regardless of whether or not it is tutored or not. <laughs> in our social economy, uh, certification is synonymous with qualification. And I think that those of you who have epistemic knowledge need to spend some time with those who have meters knowledge and write more about these principles in ways that the public can better understand. Yeah, yeah. Can I add to that? I, I really like that. I'm a big fan of that book, by the way, uh, Seeing Like a State. It's a terrific book. Uh, he's an anthropologist like your boss uh, at, at NAS, uh, all these bright anthropologists. 
Um, but the meat, the, the meat is, which is sort of relates to practice with uh, um, the ability to that, that knowledge in action. Um, and it's often local knowledge, knowledge that people have developed in, you know, of how to fish in their particular environment, how to, you know, um, how, to, how to make the most of whatever particular habitat they find themselves in. And, but, uh, but anyway, I think that, that there's an application here in the way we think about history. History is not, and I'm afraid that, um, certainly I was trained as a graduate student, most of my colleagues are trained, to regard with horror the idea of doing exactly, Bob, what you suggest that we do, that we, uh, uh, except for the ones who are openly activist, and that's always people on the left. Um, that's true. But, but, but the, 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 most of us draw back from the idea that our, our knowledge ought to in some way relate to the tasks of citizenship, of being good citizens in a republic, a republic which is a, a public thing, which is a, 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 a way of living in which we govern ourselves, uh, which uh, going back to not to 1619, but 1620, <laughs> the Mayflower Compact um, is uh, sort of deep, deep, deep in, in, in our roots too, uh, that, that idea of self-rule. How can we, um, not only how can we write about history, but how can we think about the study of I, history as something that enhances life? Not by telling us myths, not, and, and uh, somebody, Michelle Higgins, I think I saw the name flash by, said something really terrific. Um, uh, maybe we'll get to you in the questioning, but, but about, you know, we had, uh, we had the sort of version of things in the 19th century, uh, and we and uh, and that uh, that there there was a revisionism then, and now we have this revisionism, and it's no better than the other. There, we're, history can't be about mismaking. I I stress this in my book, uh, Land of Hope. Uh, uh, again and again, we can't uh, be presenting a kind of cotton candy fantasy of. Um, or in the case of 1619, that sort of hemlock candy fantasy version of what this history is. It has to be truthful, but but in the end, does it does it conduce to living well, to us being vigilant, informed, respectful, law-abiding, um, skeptical, um, self-governing people? It, you know, freedom. Uh, liberty means also be the ability to govern oneself. Uh, just does, it doesn't mean just what it, to do whatever the hell you want. Why don't we teach that in civics? I don't think we do anymore. Um, uh, why don't we? So I, 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 I think this is addressing what Bob said about Midas and uh, uh, the Midas knowledge that we, we need to think about knowledge of the past as something that's a resource for living, um, particularly when it's about our own country and about the origin of our values and the way that they're grounded. This is what the Times did. It's really, I, I, I think, I'm gonna throw this out. I mean, I think what they did is extraordinarily irresponsible. Um, and they didn't do this on a whim, on a you know a weekend bender at a retreat in, in uh, in the mountains of Chatt outside Chattanooga, where the Salzburger clan all, all gather. Now, this was something planned over a long period of time, very intricately. It's like a, it's like a military campaign, what they did. And it's extraordinarily irresp irresponsible because it doesn't, it might conduce to the achievement of a certain political objective, defeat Donald Trump, or maybe, I, I think it's more than that, but, um, but what's the net effect? What's the corrosive effect on young people, ill-educated young people who all they know about America is, is, is slavery, Indian removal, a few other, uh, you know, yes. Japanese internment. Yeah, that's it. Um, uh, what does it do? What's the corrosive effect? How does that enhance our democracy? Let um, me just add uh, that the, it's interesting that the five leading conservative scholars on poverty, 
who I've interacted with many years, seldom have ever talked to the people they write about. And a lot of what they recommend are sanctions to compel people to be responsible. Where are the studies of, res of resilience? If you say that 70% of families in these communities are raising children that are dysfunctional, then why don't we go into the households of the 30% who are raising children that are not dropping out of school, they're not in jail, they're not on drugs, to find out what are the qualities that promotes resilience hmm. and where is the center for the study of resilience? We can yeah. learn more from studying success than we can studying failure. So I really think that two things, that, that we need to know more. Scholars should study the actual uh, uh, people who embody the principles that they believe are, are, are foundational. And also they need to come together and celebrate resilience, to, to study resilience. I, I don't know of a single center that studies the resilience of people in those circumstances. Not a single one, unless yeah. I'm mistaken. I don't know of any. Well, and you know, can I add to this? There's something that's really disturbed me about the current uh, you know, awakening, uh, as some people are calling it, is, I mean, and, and I'm sure you have some thoughts about this, Bob. I am just stunned by the sudden denigration of Frederick Douglass, who is oh, yeah. Mr. Resiliency, as far as I'm concerned. This is one of the most resilient men that ever lived and, and someone that you, you can't help but be inspired by. Uh, truly a great American. Uh, and by the way, a great American who uh, uh, admired the Constitution. Uh, and uh, after, after quarreling with it and, and for a while embracing, you know, William Lloyd Garrison's sort of extremism, he, he comes around. To understanding the wisdom of American institutions, the wisdom. Dr. King's Dr. King's statue is next. Yes, yes. Well, Don't be well surprised. right, right, Don't. right, right. And and two, uh, two people, Douglas and King, were barely mentioned in 1619. That's right. That's right. I don't think Douglas is mentioned. Nor do they no, mention I, I the Democratic know. Party associating yeah. it with racism. I don't. But think his words... statue, his stat, you know, the statue rampaging. His statue is one of the ones that's been gone after. Um, and I'm just, I just find that there is, I think, a palpable movement. Um, it, you know, and some, some of this happened with King. When, you know, there were people who, after we had a national holiday for King's birthday, um, some people who were sort of disaffected. Well, you know, he's no longer useful to us as a kind of radical, transgressive icon. Uh, he's now just like oatmeal. You know, he's like cornflakes, as American as apple pie. Uh, and, and in some sense, I, I think he is. <laughs> he's as American as, you know, I don't know, chitlins, but he's, he's a very definitely American. Uh, and, and Douglas, I think, ought to be studied and, and read and, 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 and pondered. And of course, Douglas was <laughs> at all kinds of inconvenient. He was really a libertarian yeah. uh, at heart. And uh, very much of an advocate for individual liberty, even gun rights. Um, he'd be a Second Amendment guy if he was around now. Uh, uh, so maybe that's part of it, is that people discover the inconvenient aspects of Douglas for present policy. But, um, you know, Dr. King, you mentioned, I mean, the, the, one of the great things that he did, and he didn't do it all the time, and you can find very radical things that he said, that's true. But when the chips were down, 1963, you know, uh, and he gives that great speech at the Lincoln Memorial, he, uh, and, and other places too, he always comes down on the side of affirming the Judeo-Christian tradition, the biblical tradition, and the Constitution, the Declaration of the Constitution. That is the, the sort of, so to speak, the foundational elements of the American civil religion. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you don't mind me using that term. Uh, that, that, that is, a, and, and you know, even to, to begin that speech the way he does, you know, we're here, you know, he says, we're here to cash a check. You know, this is, we have an IOU that's yet to be cashed. We're here to cash it. That's 
in its way an affirmation of, of the ideals of the country. It's not, not saying that's a lie, as uh, the 1619 Project says. It's saying this, you know, we believe, we believe in this. And that's why we're here. We want, we want the promissory note to be made good, good on. It's a great, great way of making an appeal that uh, I think softened uh, the hard hearts of many people and, uh, and, and led to uh, enormous progress um, that now the 1690 Project wants to deny has ever occurred. It's just astonishing. I'm easily astonished, as you can tell. That's the part of what keeps life interesting for me. I want to, uh, well, not astonish you, but switch to a different question from the questions and answers, um, overlapping maybe a little with the previous one. Uh, this question, as a college professor, my concern is that most high school students will come to college already having been convinced that the 1619 Project narrative is patently true. Yeah, and then typically they won't take any further history courses in college or, or anywhere. Yeah. How do we confront that dearth of historical knowledge and context in this and coming generations? I just want to push that. I mean, in effect, it's no longer that you can say, hey, the 1619 Project, well, this is silly nonsense coming out of left field. What do you do when the, everybody comes to you say, well, this is the truth, of course, ain't it? Well, I think there's a limit to what you can do, but you, you have to just be willing to patiently um, you know, using the right time, you know, you don't just kind of grab people while they're on the way to the restroom and say, wait a minute, I want to tell you what it is. Uh, uh, you know, you wait for the right moment, uh, but but disabuse them. And that's all you can do. It's a small thing. You know, Socrates roamed the streets of Athens is trying to disabuse people of their bad ideas. And look what happened to him. But I think we have to follow that example. We have to, as professors, we have this wonderful opportunity to, you know, have a sort of entree into the lives of, of young people. And the thoughtful ones, the ones who are going to interrogate you, not just because they're little jerks, but because they really want to know and they really are questioning. Um, you got a great opportunity there. And I think uh, we, that's, that's the only way we can do it as professors. And we write and we speak out. One of the things that I think is really interesting, David, about the historical profession in all of this is that, and I think I mentioned this before, Sean Willens, who is a very brave man and, and somebody who does, he doesn't follow any line. I mean, he's very ma much a man of the left and he, he led the group of historians seeking to uh, support the impeachment of Donald Trump. So he's no Trumpista. Um, None of the major figures, with the possible exception of um, Alan Gelzo, uh, the major critics, would be people who would not be considered men of the left, men and women of the left. Uh, but uh, um, it, it's uh, 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 he he has spoken his mind about it, and he's a you know, he's won the Bancroft Prize. He's a top-notch historian. Gordon Wood, you can't get any better than that. James Oakes, um, the few others who, who equally, oh, James McPherson, the great Civil War historian. I think he was the first to come out and say, this is, this is rubbish. Um, uh, but the profession as a whole has been extremely quiet. Uh, if this had been something where uh, uh, the, the issue was something really, um, oh, I don't know, something much more uh, contestable. I think you'd see people uh, out there, this would be an opportunity for them to make a name for themselves, whatever. Very little, very little. And uh, I, I have to wonder you know, whether at times the, 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 the five or six major figures who have come out um, I feel that sort of by themselves. But the good side of this is the profession isn't going the other way either. I think their sentiments are, and there's a lot of people who, who sentimentally would love to be able to support the 1619 Project, um, uh, but who know, know that 
factually speaking, historically speaking, as a work of scholarship, it's just indefensible. Um, although the myth, the narrative, which is what uh, we've been told they're really about, may may be something that can can somehow survive this blizzard of factual inaccuracy. I don't think it will. I think uh, I think this could turn out to be um, even more humiliating. Uh, in the history of the New York Times than the Walter Durante scandal. Uh, Walter Durante, for those of you who don't know, was a Times reporter who, who for um, years and quite consciously and quite probably corruptly misreported news from the Soviet Union and covered up, you know, the great Ukrainian famine, the, the government induced Ukrainian famine and won a Pulitzer Prize as the 1619 Project has. Um, which has never been rescinded. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the Times has that albatross, for those of us who know about it, uh, hanging around saying, I think this is going to be an even bigger albatross, maybe a, another creature altogether, a gazelle. <laughs> Um, I'm going to have a follow-up question. Actually, this is probably more directly for uh, Bob, but it, Bill, also feel free to chime in. But are you working with the Black churches to spread the 1776, not 1619 argument? Does it make sense to focus a great deal of energy on inoculating the Black community from the 1619 narrative? Yeah, we're working closely with the Frederick Douglass Institution, Institute uh, Dean Nelson is that leader, and they have uh, uh, hundreds of black churches. Also, I would say 70% of our grassroots leaders are, are faith leaders. They don't have churches, but they are faith-centered. Uh, and so we are, we're very much, that's, they're very much open <clears throat> to new information. The black, low-income black communities, they are the sleeping giant that's going to save America. Because all of I this, agree with that. All of this is done in the name of black liberation or, or or justice for blacks, and the black community is going to wake up and realize how it's being exploited. And and I think you're going to see a rebellion. There was a part of it in the governor's race in Florida back in 2018, when Governor DeSante, the Republican, ran on the issue of choice in education, and he only won by 32,000 votes. 100,000 low-income Blacks voted for him because of choice, even though Obama, President Obama and Oprah Winfrey came in to campaign for Gillum, the Black uh, uh, opponent. So Blacks have uh, demonstrated in that situation a willingness not to vote race, but to vote the interests of their children. And I think you're going to see much more of that willingness to vote issues instead of race. I just want to chime in that I, I, I'm not as confident about the, the uh, as Bob, but I'm, I definitely think the Black church is a key to our future, and uh, that that um, it's just anything that can strengthen it, um, strengthen the, the the healthy parts of it. Because the black church, like the church everywhere, has healthy and unhealthy uh, aspects to it. But any you know anything that can strengthen the these uh, these good good aspects, I I strongly favor. Uh, because, you know, one of the things, and, and here I sort of get into things, and I think the, that the framers and founders uh, would also agree with it, that um, if you don't have a sort of source of transcendent faith, then what you have is nothing but politics. That's uh, right. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, you know, Richard Newhouse, uh, Richard John Newhouse, who founded the magazine First Things, used to say, the first thing to know about politics is that politics is not the first thing. And it, it 
it, it's a key, I think, to political effectiveness. This is something that not that many of the founders would agree with this. The key to political effectiveness is the knowledge that that our institutions, our values are grounded in something that's, that's not accessible to politics, that pre, pre-exists it and, uh, and under, undergirds it. You know, Jefferson was in effect saying this uh, when he attributed these rights that we have to uh, the creator, that um, you can interpret that in a non-religious way saying that, well, um, it means that these are not the property of government uh, to, to dispense or withhold. They are inherent in what, in who and what we are. All right, I am going to follow up. Sorry, I keep on following up with questions from the uh, questions and answers, which says, gosh, open 42 questions. Um, do you know if it is teachers who are choosing the 1619 project or if it is being mandated to them by administrators? And then also, I mean, and how about in the private schools? Uh, do you have a sense? And well, so in fact, what's the, put, you know, what's the range of forces bringing it in? And how do you compare it with all the private schools? I think it's a surge of white guilt <laughs> is propelling people to the, and, and I'm hoping that I say that two of the groups in society that give me most angst are self-flagellating guilty whites and rich, entitled, angry blacks. And I'm hoping and praying that America, white America, will reach a point of race fatigue <laughs> and push back against all of this foolishness so that we can get free to, uh, to address the deeper troubling aspects of life in America. And what that is, is that teenagers in Palo Alto, where we have two parent households, median income, they have master's degrees, Median income of 180,000. Suicide rate among its teenagers are six times the national average. And the leading cause of death in the inner city is homicide. Well, these two groups have more in common than they have their difference. One is not exempt through privilege, and the other one is not exempt because of injustice. But in order for us to really, to be able to attack that that emptiness that is creating such a devaluation of life is we must deracialize race and, dis and, and desegregate poverty. That's the goal of 1619. We've got to move, that has to be our goal so that we can come together and unite to address that moral and spiritual free fall that's occurring in our society that is consuming uh, the children of the rich and the poor. Um, I, I don't have any quantitative data on this, David, uh, but I, I have, I have impressions. I, I talk to teachers a lot. I do a, I do a summer institute here at OU every year with teachers and, uh, um, speak to charter school groups and, and that sort of thing all the time. So I'm, I, uh, and I love doing it. I love, uh, talking to teachers about what's going on. And this is obviously something I ask people about, um, Teachers, not administrators. They, they don't. They don't like having me around. But the teachers, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with. Um, and um, I, number one, and you know, this is, you know, I, I think a big, big deal. Uh, but any in the, any in the audience who are teachers will, I think, agree, readily agree with this. It's hard to say no to free materials. Um, and uh, when the Pulitzer Center comes around. And offers you all these goodies, um, how in, in, in impoverished uh, public schools, and just about all of them feel impoverished. Um, uh, yeah, maybe Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda uh, doesn't, but most of them do. Uh, it's it's going to worm its way in. Now, I, I have a, a an, an example of this. It's a 
good ex positive example. When I, I used to be on the board of the National Endowment for the Humanities when Bruce Cole was the chairman. And Bruce was an art historian and he wanted to create um, something he uh, thought of as a kind of iconography of American art for particularly young people. So we, we put together a book called Picturing America and it was also packaged as um, um, uh, reproductions that could be hung on, on walls. And, and we gave them away to, I think, 100,000 or more schools and libraries. The biggest, it's actually the biggest program NEH has ever done, believe it or not. And, uh, uh, and of course, it was, it was very heavily underwritten by some generous donors. And, and uh, uh, we found people just couldn't say no to our free goodies. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's why one of the reasons it was successful, I think it was a great idea. And it was a very unifying idea. It's that these, are, these are visual representations you know, had everything from Washington crossing the Delaware to the the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, that great photograph with everybody sort of leaning back. Um, it, it uh, the, all of that, it was this compendium of images of America. We gave it away. Uh, they're giving away the 1619 project, uh, uh, underwritten by a whole bunch of uh, foundations, I think, including the Ford Foundation and uh, MacArthur others but um uh you know that's that's one thing it's hard to compete with free materials it, it particularly when and a lot of the teachers say well, yeah you know some of it's um some of it's useful um some of the sort of nitty-gritty descriptions of of slavery in different circumstances um can be useful um the, 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 the whole magazine, uh, the 100 page issue of the New York Times Magazine had uh, a, a, a bunch of articles. I don't remember how many, but and some of them were actually quite interesting and good. They, and they didn't really relate very much to the 1619 theme. Um, uh, and I assume some of those materials are being made available. I've only seen a few uh, fragmentary materials for the 1619 project, but so teachers, you know, teachers are smart, uh, the ones who are energetic, uh, and they pick and choose from the materials you give them. So I'm, I'm a little less um, apocalyptic about uh, this than some people are. I think they're, they're still going to need other materials to supplement them. I think Howard Zinn's book being used so widely is much worse, and we've been living with that for decades now. Um, that's, a, that's a, I mean, I think that whole view of Columbus kind of intruding on a uh, on an idyllic uh, Arawak uh, settlement, that, that's Howard Zinn. That, we owe that to Howard Zinn. Um, and, uh, 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 but I, I think, and I think uh, charter schools, private school teachers, um, they're not really messing with it at all. So I, I, I think you're really, it's a, it's a sort of mainline public schools, that's where you're gonna see the effect. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware uh, yet of the impact. I think I may see it next year, you know, uh, if we have uh, graduating seniors as freshmen uh, in, in my classes. I will just sort of interject, rich private schools in New York City are going whole hog for this stuff. Yeah, yeah they are, so, they are. You know, <laughs> they are, they are indeed. You know, the Brerley School and uh, Spence, you know, I, I've heard about places like that going, going great guns. And, and, and there, I think Bob's answer about white guilt is, is, is pretty key. Um, and um, there really be, you know, Shelby still wrote a nice book about white guilt that didn't get much attention, I'm afraid, but uh, it is, uh, it's, I, I think it is one of the most pernicious forces one of the it, it is it's a kind of white supremacy 2.0 uh because it's really if, if you're consumed with white guilt that everything um affecting 
people with black and brown skins is somehow filtered through you. <laughs> what kind of narcissism is that? It's all about me. It's all about me. Uh, Kenosha is all about me. Um, it's it's a it, it, it's a colossal form of of narcissism, but it's not seen that way. It's seen as a great as an expression of a of a great and capacious conscience, um, and uh, that's too bad. I think that's a form of self delusion. But it, but again. Um, I'll let Bob speak to this if he'd like, but I mean, I think it ought to enrage African Americans because it's another way of saying, I am somehow the one who speaks for you. Um, you be quiet, Absolutely. let me speak for you. <laughs> no, it, it is true. And that's what, it, it's just self-marginalizing for someone to say that somehow my destiny is determined by what you do. It really is. That's why I called mm -hmm. it a form of white supremacy yeah. and a form of surrender. Uh, you know, there are two ways that you can deny people an opportunity to, to, to pursue a future. One is to deny them by law, the way we did under Jim Crow. The second and the most pernicious way is to tell them they don't have to compete, that all they've got to do is sit at the gambler's table and wait to be dealt a winning hand. <laughs> because life is, was, was unfair to you in the past. So just nothing is, is more despoiling than that. The very fact that it's insulting that the, uh, the, that the Smithsonian Institution on Black History uh, can issue a statement saying that uh, hard work is whiteness, <laughs> delayed gratification, a whole list, nothing is more insulting it's a new form of slavery. And so, but uh, again, uh, black Americans, low income blacks are gonna wake up and that sleeping giant wakes up. It will be the, a day that's going to help save this country. I hope you're right about that. That about the churches especially, I hope you're right about that. Yep. I have a query actually with, you know, condensing a number of different comments and queries. Um, basically, they're all focusing on the state boards of education and saying, in effect, the state boards are you know, including you know, 1619 project-ish, Zinnish material. The teachers are then graded on how much what they teach conforms to it. You know, they have no choice. Uh, the sort of, sort of follow-up is, how do you change what the state boards of education are giving out as history standards? Yeah, and make sure that it's not 1619 projectized. Yeah, I, this is something I don't know a lot about, the mechanics of this, but I'm about to learn about it. So <laughs> that's the best I can do by way of answering. But I, I, think, um, <clears throat> I think it's different. It's, and I know it's different in every state. And, uh, um, you, you know, it's sometimes it's, these things are decided on the state level, sometimes more low, more counties, even municipalities. So it's, you know, the great old American, you know, federalist crazy quilt of, uh, of different, um, different authorities, different standards. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we, we don't, we don't have national standards, thank goodness. Um, but um uh, yeah, I don't really know the. I, I really don't know the answer to that question. I will know more in a few weeks because I'm consulting with some people about this. Bob, do you have a? Is that something on state boards of education? It's out of my wheelhouse. Okay. One thing I okay, do I, know from case, having I'll... been a homeschooling parent, and this has been a while, but um, there's a there's a remarkable degree, and it's was hard won. But there's a mar remarkable degree of of openness in a great many states, including um, some blue states like Maryland. Uh, you'd be surprised. Um, Maryland is Maryland's a much better place to be a homeschooler than Tennessee. I can, from experience, <laughs> attest to that. Um, and uh, that's partly because their curricular standards and their standards of evaluation for you know, non-traditional students are 
are different and better. So, um, you know, a lot of the red, red, blue thing doesn't track exactly the way you think it would. I have a question, which depending upon how long the two of you take to answer, may be our closing uh, question. Um, anyway, I'm choosing this on the theory there won't be another one, um, though there might. Our homeschool group is preparing a history and civics class for 12 to 15 year olds. When we address the inaccuracies of the 1619 project, what do you believe are the most important counterpoints we can teach our students? Well, let me go first on that, and, and I'll try not to go too long. Uh, that's tempting, but look, I think one I don't of, mind if you go too long. Well, one of the things, look, look, one of the things that when I teach about this and related subjects, that it invariably astonishes students and leads to further discussion, often with a kind of horrified look on faces of some students, is is the uh, the assertion that slavery is uh, more the norm than the exception, more the rule than the exception in human history, and that it's uh, it's um, it's one of the great achievements of modernity to to push it to the margins. It's not gone. Um, Mauritania has twenty five percent of its population, by uh, conservative estimates, is enslaved. So it's, it's not gone. I wish New York Times would show more interest in that. But um, it has, it, it, it's, it's a great achievement. It's sort of like being, <laughs> I, I mean, we're so accustomed to the idea that, that human beings are good, naturally good. You know, we, we used to be Calvinists back in the 17th century, you know, the Puritans, and, and sort of assume the worst about human nature. Well, there's obviously a mean between the two, but the the record of human history is, is mostly dismal. And it's really only against that background that you can appreciate what an extraordinary thing was done here in 1776, Bob Woodson's 1776. Um, and uh, uh, so that I think it, more, uh, more attention to uh, that the the violence and disorder um, that it prevailed in so much of the world um, before uh, the the advent of the United States, and now, of course, carrying over into it, because you know, again, I go back to the statement that there, there's a uh, there's a kind of moral revolution that takes place. In these years, the American Revolution is part of that moral revolution. It's a key inflection point in that revolution, but it's not completed all at once. I've mentioned John Willens a couple of times. He, he he wrote an extraordinary book, which you couldn't use with your homeschooling group, but called uh, "No Property in Man." I recommend it to everybody watching because he gives uh, the fullest. But it's really about the question of is the Constitution a pro-slavery document. It, 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 it gives, and, and I think he gives, uh, it, it, he bends over backwards to give uh, some credibility to the pro line. And there is evidence for that, which I'm not gonna take time to talk about, but absolutely there are provisions in the constitution that protect the institution of slavery. But the, the issue comes down to, is it, is it spirit? Is it fundamental gradient and tendency uh, towards slavery toward and, and Willens concludes no um, uh, and uh, I think that's a very important very important issue and it's important to be right on it and to be well grounded in that so I think that's something don't run away from that issue because I think the truth the truth is friendly <laughs> in this instance the truth is friendly to a, a vindication of the American project but 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 not, we're, we're not perfect and and we're grievously not perfect I mean it's not just a kind of little little flaw I I don't like the characterization of, of slavery as America's original sin I think theologically that's uh, inaccurate but it is it is something that has been persistent 
and has um, whose effects have been have been persistent. And uh, I I don't disagree with people who want to who want to stress that and come back to it again and again. Um, which comes back to my missed opportunity. I think there's a way in which this could all have been done that would have been enormously productive. But instead, I think we have a real mess on our hands. Dr. Woodson, what would you have yeah. for your central points? About young people, about how to influence them? Yeah. Or uh, what should they be taught? Uh, you know, count, you know, you know, if, if, you know, to counter you know, being taught the 1619 project, you know, when you address the inaccuracies, what the most important counterpoints we can teach our students? Well, well, I think the the the, the counterpoint, it, 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 I think the body of facts that we are amounting in not just facts but uh, parables <laughs> that we show them. That's the content. The question is, how do we uh, deal with their perceptions that are sometimes more important than the content. And uh, I know a lot of white suburban kids get a lot, take a lot of their cultural messages from inner city black kids. That's why rap songs go, go, go platinum, not because, because there's not enough white black kids to buy them. And so what we're doing is taking some of those inner city uh, black kids and preparing them to send a different cultural message to other, their peers that will also include kids in white suburban too. So we've got to, uh, we've got to invest in some innovative ways to communicate cultural messages that begins to influence people's perception about facts, not just the facts themselves. All right. Um, I'm going to say then we've I've reached our, uh, you know, planned time at 3.31 or so. I'm going to say thank you both very, very much for agreeing to be on the NAS webinar. Um, we're delighted and I'm delighted to all that we had such a wonderfully large participation in our audience. Again, you know, several hundred people uh, signed up and we're listening just now. Um, so I just want to repeat to everybody uh, this has been recorded, so the participants and the audience members will all be getting a web, you know, an email saying, hi, here, you can look at this and um, read more about it. Um, Dr. Woodson's organization is 1776 Unites. I strongly urge everyone to take a look at what it's doing. Dr. Wilfred McClay's latest uh, book on American history, Land of Hope. Uh, I, I've read it myself. It's a delight. Everyone should read it. Um, and, and and these and, and these are both not just criticizing the 1619 project. Both Dr. Woodson and Dr. McClay are giving a positive vision of what is the true, the better narrative of American history. It's worth knowing about that. And I'll just say you know, again to chew at our own horn, we will be having another conference, you know, slavery versus freedom. Uh, at this point, I believe September 14th to September 18th, digital online. Uh, we will encourage everybody from around the country and indeed the world uh, to uh, listen to it. Um, and you will be hearing an awful lot more thoughtful uh, responses about both the history, the modern politics, the education politics of the 1619 project and how to counter it. All right. So. Uh, I am going to basically uh, stop my, at this point and say thank you again both very much. Can I say one thing? I noticed several oh, people yeah. in the chat, I've been try, I've been inconsistently following it, but several people wanted to know the name of the book by Sean Willens that I cited. It's No Property in Man. Um, I strongly recommend it. It's just a superb example of historianship and uh, dealing with a hugely important question. Um, and I think coming up with a very convincing answer that affirms uh, that affirms the Constitution. So, okay. well, so I will say goodbye now. Thank you, thank you again, everyone, so much. <laughs>